Okay, how we looking? Okay, so that looks good. Awesome. We got one minute, thirty seconds to go. <clears throat> Okay, it's nine o'clock. Let's get started. All right, today we're covering how to actually navigate in the clouds. Here's the uh, uh, the outline. We're gonna start with an introduction. We're gonna get into basic attitude instrument flying. We're gonna talk about intercepting and tracking navigational systems and DME arcs. We'll do a Q&A at the end. And then uh, of course, if you have any questions throughout the presentation, just uh, drop them in the comments and I'll try to address them as we go. I'll try to keep an eye on the comments. If, uh, yeah, again. Drop your questions in the comments. All right, here. Uh, introduction, who am I? My name is Monty. I'm a CFI. Uh, I'm a um, former uh, U.S. Army Ranger. I uh, deployed twice with ACO 275, and then I founded the Emerald Squadron Aviation. Uh, my objective is to build a flight school to help you learn how to fly. All right, so let's talk about basic attitude instrument flying. The objective of this is to develop knowledge of instrument flying. Uh, it's the ability to smooth, smoothly and steadily control the airplane without outside references. And the key elements that I want you to take away from this, if nothing else, if you get nothing from this, I want you to remember pitch plus power equals performance. I want you to remember to trim your aircraft so you can fly hands off, uh, cross check, and then adjust your controls to, uh, you know, to fly the plane the way you want it. So. Uh, let's talk about control and performance. Uh, we're typically going to set the airplane with some pitch or attitude and then some power setting, and that pitch plus power will give us some performance. And typically there are three general categories of instruments that we're going to talk about today. Uh, they are the control, performance, and navigation instruments. So let's talk about the three categories. Control instruments are the instruments that we use to tell the airplane what we want it to do. For example, the attitude indicator. I want my nose on the horizon, wings level, and then our power indicators. I want to set my power uh, say 2300 RPM, and I want my nose on the horizon wings level. And then we use our performance instruments, the airspeed indicator, the altimeter, the vertical speed indicator, our heading and turn coordinator, uh, to gauge our performance, to see if what we put into the aircraft uh, is, and, and it's doing what we want it to do, essentially. And then finally, there are navigation instruments. These indicate our, our position in uh, three-dimensional di three space, uh, VOR, ILS, GPS. We'll talk about those a little bit more later on, but today we're gonna be focusing on control and performance instruments questions so far no good okay so how do we fly in the clouds there are four steps really uh, we want to establish uh, the aircraft and then we're gonna trim off those pressures so we can fly hands off we'll do a cross check to conform uh, co confirm that the airplane is doing what we want it to do and then finally we'll adjust to fine-tune uh, so that the airplane does what we want it to do uh, so how do we establish first fly that attitude indicator the attitude indicator is my favorite instrument because it's got a little uh, nose and wings. Uh, you're flying the airplane, you put your nose on the horizon, wings level, and the aircraft should theoretically fly straight and level. You wanna pitch up for a climb, bring your, you know, uh, put in some nose up attitude on your control, uh, on your controls, and then put your nose above the horizon. Fly the airplane through the attitude indicator. Uh, if you wanna descent, nose down. If you wanna turn, wings left, wings, left, wings to the right. And then we set our power using our tachometer and our manifold pressure gauge. Now, some common errors uh, in basic instrument flying are uh, not flying with reference to the attitude indicator. Basically, not focusing on that and just look, you know, spreading your attention all over the place, or hyperfixation on one individual instrument and not paying attention to the rest of the instruments. All right. Uh, so we establish the aircraft. We put our nose on the horizon, wings level, power set. Then we trim off those pressures. You should be trimming all the time. My private pilot students, uh, we do trim day one, right? Uh, so trim the control pressures off so that you can take your hands off the controls and the airplane stays where you put it. Some common errors are not trimming the airplane or using too much trim and flying the trim, uh, flying by trim only. <clears throat> 
And then there's the cross check. There are a couple of different flavors of cross checks. Uh, there's one here where you start at the attitude indicator because that's how you establish yourself. And then you look at your turn coordinator back to the attitude indicator, down to the VSI. It's called the inverted V, I guess. Yeah, inverted V. Uh, the rectangular uh, pattern, basically you start at the attitude indicator and just move rectangularly around the, um, the instruments. My favorite is this one at the top right. Uh, I like to start at the attitude indicator, go down to the VSI, back to the attitude indicator, down to the heading indicator, back to the attitude indicator, turn coordinator, right? Everything stems off of this instrument here. I fly the plane with the attitude indicator and then confirm everything else. Now some common errors in your cross check are hyperfixation on one instrument. You are you establish yourself on your uh, your uh, nose on the horizon wings level, and then you're just hyper -focus, uh, focusing on your uh, your heading indicator. Like, oh, am I on heading? And then you stop paying attention to flying the airplane, and you start to get out of whack. You either climb or descend. You speed up too much. You forget to you know uh, put in the proper rudder inputs. That's hyperfixation, focusing on one instrument too much. Uh, or omission, where you forget to look at an instrument, uh, or uh, putting too much emphasis on one instrument. Now let's talk about in instrument interpretation. We have to understand how each instrument works, and we did that last week. We covered uh, the basic principles of the pitostatic system and the gyroscopic principles of the gyro system, so the uh, attitude indicator, heading indicator, and turn coordinator. Now, in general, pitch, your pitch instruments are going to be your airspeed indicator, your altimeter, VSI, and attitude indicator. And if you think about it, if we go back up here, all those give you information about pitch. Your attitude indicator gives you pitch relative to the horizon. Your airspeed indicator, if you pitch up, you will slow down. Of course, if you don't change anything else. If you uh, pitch down, you will speed up. Uh, if you are nose high, you are likely to climb. And if you're nose high, you're likely to uh, uh, have a, a climb indicated or a positive vertical speed. So these are all pitch instruments. And then the bank instruments are, for the most part, your gyroscopic instruments. You've got your attitude indicator. It gives you information about your angle of bank. Your uh, turn coordinator, which gives you information about whether or not you're on a standard rate turn and uh, the quality of your turn. And then your heading ind indicator gives you information about your heading. As you turn, you will change heading. All right, so those are your pitch and bank instruments. And of course, your power instruments, uh, it's not on here, but that's gonna be your tachometer and your manifold pressure gauge. So we've established ourselves uh, nose on the horizon, wings level. Uh, we've trimmed off control pressures to fly the airplane, hands off. Uh, we've cross-checked to make sure that everything is looking good. And then finally, we make small adjustments, uh, small corrections to make sure that the airplane stays where we want it and it's doing what we want it to do. Really, we should be doing shallow banks, you know, nothing greater than 30 degrees of bank. Uh, and then uh, again, some of the common errors here are incorrect interpretation of the instruments or improper control. Uh, and using rudder to fix your heading, that's not right, right? You use rudder to, um, to coordinate your turn, right? Okay, let's talk about maneuvering now. Straight and level flight is pretty straightforward. You fly your airplane, right? Here's your airplane, this is your nose, these are your wings. You put your nose on the horizon, wings level, set your power, and then, uh, and then you monitor, right? Um, by the way, we're going to talk about straight, the four fundamental flight maneuvers, straight and level flight, turns, climbs, and descents. So straight and level flight, again, we set our nose on the horizon, wings level, power for a nice comfortable cruise, we trim off those control pressures, and then we're going to cross check uh, to make sure that everything's looking good. Vertical speed is zero, our airspeed is stabilized, our heading is stabilized, uh, and then if we need to, if we're you know, in a slight climb, adjust your pitch or power or your trim, whatever you got to do. To maintain level flight it's pretty basic nose on the horizon wings level not climbing not turning and we're coordinated and our airspeed is stabilized straight and level flight now let's execute a turn now if we want to stay at the same altitude we're gonna for the most part keep our nose on the horizon we're just gonna put in a little bit of uh, aileron pressure to turn the aircraft and here we're at about 15 degrees of bank in a standard rate turn nose on the horizon, wings to the left. Our vertical speed is zero, our altitude is remaining 4,000 feet, and we are turning, right? Now let's talk about, uh, so we go back to um, straight and level flight. From a turn, we're going to put in opposite aileron pressure, again, keep our nose on the horizon, uh, and then return to straight and level flight, and we should, again, trim off control pressures. You should be trimming for the turn and for the straight and level. Um, and if you think about it, if you are in a turn, your vertical component of lift is being reduced. You are 
changing your lift vector so that you lose some vertical component of lift. So you might need a little bit of back pressure uh, or uh, trim to, to, uh, to account for that loss of lift. The question's good. All right, let's talk about climbs. We are going to add power and put our nose above the horizon to initiate a climb. Uh, we fly the airplane through the added indicator, get it above the horizon, verify with our vertical speed uh, to initiate that climb, and then we will monitor and make sure that everything's looking good. Wings should stay level unless we're doing a climbing turn. In, the case, in this case, we're not. And when we're ready, we will reduce our power back to our cruise setting, put our nose back on the horizon, and go back to straight and level flight, zero on the VSI. And then finally, let's do our descents. You can reduce power, put your nose below the horizon, or you might not even need to do that, honestly. You can just bring your power back. A lot of the time, power dictates your vertical speed and altitude. You reduce your power enough to get a, in this case, a 200 foot per minute rate of descent, wings level, uh, nose slightly below the horizon, and then we stabilize our heading and uh, airspeed. Everything looks great. And when we're ready, we can uh, add some power, get our nose back to the horizon, and trim off our control pressures and go back to straight and level flight. So that is our basic flight maneuvers, the four fundamental flight maneuvers in IFR, and that's how you fly them. Questions? No? Good. All right, let's talk about intercepting and tracking navigational systems and DME arcs. Now the objective is to develop knowledge of the elements related to BORs, which are very high frequency omnidirectional range radio systems. And we covered this last week when we talked about our instruments. Um, Basically, a, a VOR sends out radials in all directions, and we pick one and we fly either to or from or use it for navigation. Now, the elements here, we're going to talk about the components of the VOR, tracking the VOR, some VOR tips, intercepting and selecting the course, and then tracking a DME arc. And we'll talk about why we do that here in a bit. Now, the key elements, always verify the VOR ID. Uh, if you don't verify the VOR is active and you're on the right frequency, you could be flying all day and never uh, get to where you know where you're trying to go. Uh, you don't want to fly the tail. You want to select the appropriate to or from indication. You don't want to be reverse sensing. And remember that VORs are line of sight. So if you are behind a mountain, your VOR is not going to help you. Or if you are on the other side of the planet, your VOR will be virtually useless. Cool. All right, let's do it. Let's talk about the components of the VOR. There's the ground transmitter, which again is uh, restricted to line of sight and it's aligned with magnetic north so if you look at your chart let's say on sky vector or your paper chart you'll notice that the uh, vor rings are not lined up with the true north uh, or the grid lines they are aligned with magnetic north and there are 360 degree courses or radials uh, that either go to or from the station now there's the receiver in the aircraft the antenna receives the signal and then there's a tuning device inside the aircraft that you can use to tune uh, and ID the, uh, the VOR. And then your uh, instrument that you're actually going to fly with, there's the OBS or the Omni Bearing Selector. This is the knob that you turn to change the, uh, the course that you select and the CDI or the course deviation indicator uh, that will select the course that you want. And then there's the to or from indicator that tells you whether or not you're flying to the station or away from the station. Remember, if you want to go to the station, go to. If you want to fly away from, fly from. It's Simple. Now let's talk about tracking the VOR. The first thing you want to do is tune to that frequency. Uh, at Painfield, the frequency is 110.6. We're going to dial it in on our navigational radio. We'll listen to the Morse code identifier. I don't remember what it is. I, you just verify with the chart. If you hear it, that's great. That means you can use it. If there is, if it's out of service, the Morse code will not be uh, being broadcasted. And if you don't hear the Morse code identifier, do not use it for navigation. It, it will not provide a safe form of navigation. Uh, also, if you are on frequency and the instrument uh, tells you, gives you a little flag that says, hey, I'm not receiving this signal, uh, this, uh, this frequency, you can't use it either. Then, so we've tuned to the frequency 110.6. We listen, listen to the Morse code identifier, dee dee dat 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 whatever it is. And then we're going to rotate our OBS knob uh, to center the CDI, the course deviation indicator, with the two indication or from if you're trying to fly away. <clears throat> and that indicates either the radial or the course that we're on. And then remember the VOR, like we talked about last time, does not care where your nose is pointed. It only cares uh, what your position relative to that station is. So uh, you want to fly to in the same direction that your 
VOR indicates. Otherwise, you're, it'll be virtually useless. And then once you're established, you can account for wind if you notice that you're on heading, your VOR, uh, you're, you're following the VOR, but you're drifting off course, there's a good chance that you're being pushed off course uh, by the wind, and you'll need to ad adjust for that. Now what happens when you get to the station? Now if you're flying to the station with a two indication, and then you bypass the station, it'll switch from a to to a from indication. It'll still say the same uh, course. Let's say in this case, we're flying 210 to the station. Uh, once, we, once we fly over it, it'll switch from a to to a from, and it will stay on the 210 radial, and we'll fly away from the station on the course, or on the radial 210. Uh, and then once you are, if, if your objective is to continue on in the same direction, then you don't really have to do anything, just keep flying it. But if you get to the station and then your objective is to change your course, let's say to a different uh, waypoint, then you're going to want to tune. Let's say we're on a 210 here, we'll fly 2102. Once the needle switches from a to to a from, we can change it to our next radially when we fly and then turn to that heading and fly it, fly it out. Now if you plug in or if you dial in uh, the wrong indication, let's say we're going, we want to fly to the station, but we get a 180 from, it will reverse sense. It will tell you the opposite of what you need to do. Uh, it'll tell you that you are to the right, of course, and you will try to capture the needle and you will never get to it. You need to pull the needle when you're reverse sensing. It's confusing. Don't, don't fly with reverse sensing, basically. Okay. Uh, some VOR tips. Always identify the station. Verify that the Morse code is active. Remember that VORs are line of sight only. Don't try to fly on, you know, with a VOR on the other side of the planet or on the other side of the mountains. Uh, if you see that you are on your heading and your radial are, are both pointing the same direction, but you're being pushed off course, don't try to reset the radial or reset the CDI. Uh, try to account for wind. You know, uh, if you're being pushed off to the left, give yourself like a 10 degree turn to the right and then try to track that, that course. For example, if you are on this one and you're being pushed off to the, from the right to the left, what you can do instead of flying with your nose pointed at the station, you can crab into the wind like this. And that way the wind will push you onto the course that you want. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay. Uh, and then finally, uh, always fly with the correct indication. If you're flying to the station, fly to. If you're flying from, fly from. From. Don't ever try to reverse sense. It's confusing and annoying. Don't do it. Cool. Questions so far? No. Awesome. Good. Okay. Let's talk about intercepting and tracking a course. First of all, you want to be aware of your position, right? When you're flying, you want to know where you are, what radial you're on. Think about where you want to go, inbound or outbound, select the right course to or from, and then how are we going to get there? Uh, there is a formula for, um, for calculating your exact intercept angle. Uh, it's uh, your current radial minus your target radial times two, and then apply it in the direction that you want, and I'll show you an example here what I mean. Uh, it can be useful. For example, if you are currently on the 090 radial and you're trying to get to the 030 radial from the station, first, dial the frequency in. The second, verify the Morse code is active, and then, uh, and then you can do whatever you need to do. All right, uh, so we can do 090 minus 030. That's 60 degrees of difference. We'll double it. That's 120 degrees of difference. And we'll apply it in this direction. Apply it to the left. And so we want to fly a heading of 330. And that should give us a 60 degree intercept angle. So if we're flying 330, we will eventually hit the 030 radial at a 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 degree angle. Like that. Bam. And then when you're there, of course, turn to that heading 030 and track that radial outbound. This is this can be useful. Uh, if you are overwhelmed, you can just do a 45 degree intercept and these little things right here uh, these little orange marks give you 45 degrees. It's a nice visual way to just get a quick estimate 
again, really useful if you have the time and uh, headspace to work. But if you're overwhelmed, you can just shoot for an, a 45 degree intercept and get on your radial. All right, let's talk about intercepting and tracking a DME arc. What the heck is a DME arc? Basically, you are uh, selecting a VOR and you're going to stay at a constant radius, let's say in this case, nine miles, away from that station on an arc until you are ready to establish yourself on a final approach course or wherever you wanna go. So you're gonna stay nine miles away and you're gonna track this VOR as you do it. So you need two things for this. You need a, a, to be able to receive the VOR, so a VOR or indicator, and you need distance measuring equipment or DME. Remember that distance measuring equipment uh, in the aircraft, they, we send out a signal to the station, the signal gets pinged back to us and our instrument interprets it, interprets it uh, to a distance. It takes that time delay and turns it into a distance. So the first thing we're gonna do when we uh, track a D or we're trying to track a DME arc, of course, dial in the frequency, verify the Morse code is active, and then select the course that we want, and then we're gonna intercept that radial uh, on the approach plate. <clears throat> now, a half mile before we reach the arc, let's say this is the radial, the initial radio. We're gonna come in here, establish ourselves on the radial, and then if this is the point where we need to turn, we're gonna turn about a half mile ahead of it, 90 degrees to the right. Uh, or to the left, depending on where you're going. Then you're gonna turn your OBS needle 10 degrees in the direction you're flying. So you're gonna change, let's say we're on the 270 radio. We're gonna change it to 280. We're gonna turn 90 degrees to the right, and we're gonna wait until that needle centers. When it does, we'll turn another 10 degrees, and we'll twist the needle again another 10 degrees. Twist 10, turn 10. All right, and we're gonna re uh, repeat until we're about 10 degrees uh, ahead, uh, out from the inbound course. And then we can f turn final. Now, if the DME distance gets too big or too small, you'll need to adjust. So if you are flying this arc and you notice that, oh no, I'm getting, I'm flying away from the station more than I need to, I'm like at nine and a half miles, you'll need to make a sharper turn to intercept that arc and then adjust. You might be getting blown off because of wind. Um, Right? If you are getting, if you are flying too close to the station, you'll need to uh, relax your turn a bit and then get back onto that arc. Right? And then of course adjust depending on what you need to do. Okay? Or the easy way to do it is just plug in the DME arc or the approach plate into your GPS and just follow the magenta line. Definitely learn how to do it the old school way and then you can use the new uh, GPS systems and uh, everything will be easy. Now some com common errors are not tuning in the correct frequency or the correct radial or failing to identify uh, <clears throat> and then failing to set a proper nav or course. All right, so let's talk about actually doing it. This is what it looks like. We're looking at our approach plate. There's pain field, uh, pain VOR 110.6. There's the Morse code identifier, identifier. So we'll hear dot, dash, dash, dot, dot, dash, dot. If you hear that, we can use it. We'll tune to the 236 radial and we'll fly it, right? We'll, once we are, once the needle is centered, we'll establish ourselves on this 236 radio, flying a heading of 236, of course, counting for wind. And then we wanna turn to the right. So we will add 10 degrees to this radial. So we will tune our OBS to 246, and we will turn 90 degrees to the right, which will be a heading of uh, 326. So we are flying a heading of 326, and we're waiting for the uh, 246 radial to come in. Once we intercept it, we'll turn another 10 degrees to a heading of 336, and we'll tune to the next 10 degree radial. We'll add another 10 degrees, so 236, 246. When we hit that one, when the needle centers, we know we've intercepted, we'll add another 10 degrees to both, twist 10, turn 10. We'll add 10 degrees to our turn, so a heading of 346, and we'll turn another 10 degrees on the OBS for a radial of 256. And we'll keep doing that until we're established. Now, what happens again if we are way out here and we've gone way beyond our nine DME, our nine miles out? We'll need to make a sharper turn to the right to get back onto that arc. So instead of, 
twisting or instead of turning 10 degrees, we might turn 15 degrees or 20 degrees, again, accounting for wind. It's a, you know, variables. Once we're established on it again, we'll relax that turn and just track that nine DME arc, turning every 10 degrees or so. And then once we're 10 degrees away, we will then turn to the uh, 160 course two pane. We'll turn to a heading of 160, and now we're established on final approach, and we can uh, trim for the you know set ourselves up for a, an awesome landing. So that's our DME arc in very basic terms. Hope that helps. Okay, that covers our basic instrument flying. Uh, it covers our uh, tracking nav systems, and it covers our DME arc. Now what's next? Go quiz yourself. Go practice a quiz every day, at least 10 to 15 questions a day. Uh, identify your weak areas and then go study them in the appropriate handbook and then quiz yourself again in the afternoon, 10 to 15 questions. Turn your weaknesses into your strengths. I remember when I was in engineering, uh, when I was at UW going to school for engineering, I asked a professor, a calculus professor, I was like, hey, I would like to do well on my exam. What, what questions should I do in the back of the book? And he looked at me like an idiot. He's like, all of them. And I was like, okay, that's not really helpful. Like, what, which, what am I going to see in the exam? He's like, no, go do all of the questions. Go do all of the problems. In fact, go find a calculus textbook and do more than what's in the back of the book. Basically, constantly test yourself, and that's how you're going to uh, improve and get better. Uh, so go do that. Quiz yourself. Uh, Turn your weaknesses into your strengths. And then if you want, go book a ride on Emerald Squadron Aviation website uh, and let's go fly. Um, and then um, I would recommend picking up the Pass Your Instrument Check Ride uh, audiobook by Jason Shepard. This is how I passed my private instrument and commercial uh, check rides. I listened to this audiobook religiously while I was driving, while I was walking, while I was working out. You can find that on my website, emeraldsquadronaviation.com. It uh, doesn't cost you anything extra, but it does support uh, the channel and does support uh, the, uh, the dream. Cool. Okay, Q&A. Any questions? I'll be doodling for a little bit until you guys are, uh, until we call it another four minutes or so. I'll just monitor. All right, well, if there are no other questions, thanks for joining me, guys. I really appreciate it. I will try to do this once a week. Um, if you have any topics that you want me to cover, uh, just let me know down in the comments. Shoot me a DM, and I'll make sure to cover them. Thanks for watching.